after a brief interlude with a negative king, we arrive at Josiah, who in many ways is going to be the last true king in Judah. And his reign is almost completely positive, with one failure at the end. But his success is going to push down the road the dramatic decline of the kingdom that we're going to see when he's no longer on the throne. In Lightheart here is noting the parallel structure between chapters 34 and 35. So in chapter 34, it begins with the reform of worship and the repair of the temple, then the discovery of the law, as well as a prophecy by Holda, the prophetess, and then a renewal of the covenant. And that's chapter 34. Chapter 35 is going to mirror this material. So we have the Passover being celebrated, which mirrors the reform, as well as the repair of the temple. We're going to have a prophetic word spoken by Pharaoh, and that is mirrored by Holda, the prophetess, giving an oracle to Josiah. And then in C&C Prime, we have the positive reaction to the word of the Lord and the oracle of the Lord. And then here in C prime, we're going to get the negative reaction by Josiah to the word of the prophet, so to speak. And of course, the negative consequences of that. But we'll push down to Dillard and he's pointing out here that there are these similarities in the reign of Josiah and Joash. Both came to the throne while children, both collected funds to renovate the temple, Both stood in the temple precincts, in the king's palace. Both led the nation in covenant renewal in the temple. But here, the parallels end. So Joash was only faithful as long as Jehoiada, the prophet, was still alive. As soon as he died, Joash went off the rails a bit. Whereas Josiah remained faithful, again, except for that tiny mistake that ends up costing him his life at the very end. But we will go ahead and push into the narrative itself. Verse 1 reads, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And let's go ahead and take a look at some of this stuff. First off, it should be noted here, verses 1 through 7 are sectioned off by a paragraph break in the Masoretic text, and it's 102 words, or 6 times 17. Verses 8 through 17 are 187 words, or 11 times 17. This is according to Casper Labashane. And this is one of the rare times where he actually himself inserts a break. He believes that there's one here. And in doing so, though, it creates this interesting symmetry, because These two sections obviously are governed by the divine number 17, but verses 1 through 17 are 289 words, which is 17 times 17. So you have a a complete symmetry there on a word level. And we're going to encounter this in chapter 35 as well. And it should be noted here that Josiah is compared positively with David. And in Chronicles, Klein is pointing out that only Hezekiah and Josiah are compared positively with David like this. Of course, we had Ahaz previously in chapter 28, I believe, was compared negatively to David. He did not do as David, his father, had done. And similarly, this language of the right or the left and not veering comes out of Deuteronomy 5.32, which says, You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And so Josiah is completely portrayed positively here in his evaluation. Picking up in verse 3, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim and the carved and metal images. And we'll break off there and point out here that Williamson is pointing out that he believes that at this point, Josiah was still a regent. He was not yet completely brought into his own. Now, what's interesting, of course, is it says in the 12th year is when he actually begins. So his loyalty, his faith really begins very young, but it's 
when he reaches apparently the age of 20 is when he actually begins the Reformation project. And Johnstone says, no doubt significantly, the practical steps to implement this resolve coincide with his reaching the age of 20, the age of eligibility to be called up for military service. For Josiah, that enlistment can only be for service in the Lord's host. And again, he compares this concept to the legislation of Exodus 30, 11 through 16, the Moses tax that, of course, is very crucial to David in 1 Chronicles 21. So Josiah begins the Reformation project and is tearing down the idols and the bells and picking up at verse 4, and they chop down the altars of the bells in his presence and cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the Asherim and the carved and the metal images, and he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And we'll break off there. Lightheart here is noting that it is again a fourfold purge, this time with four verbs, tear, beat, grind, and chop, directed against four objects, altars, asherim, images, and incense altars. These images are on the height of the ascent. That's how Lightheart translates this phrase here as that stood above them. I like Lightheart's uh, rather creative translation because it's a bit of an odd phrase, but as he's pointing out here, it's another of the chronicler's puns on the key term ma'al. By pulling them from their height, Josiah eliminates the sacrileges of his fathers and staves off their effects. Josiah is a new Joshua, conquering the land and cleansing idolatry. And Johnstone similarly picks up on this. He says, it is difficult not to see in the note on the incense burners, which were above them, a double play on Maal, the presumptuous denial of God of the worship due to him alone, one of the major themes of the work. And so this sacrilegious act, this Maal, is punned on doubly with these incense altars. And then we'll pick up here with Dillard. He says, though not explicitly stated, the chronicler implies that Josiah executed the priests of Baal following the precedent set by Jehu and Jehoiada. Josiah suits the punishment to the crime. The priests who burned sacrifices to Baal have their own bones burned on the same altars. Some are even disinterred for this purpose. The chronicler does not report that the ashes from the defiled temple implements in Judah were carried to Bethel. But this is a rather interesting note because the idolatry that they had fallen into, going all the way back to Manasseh, although he was repentant, apparently his previous idolatry included child sacrifice and some really horrific things. Of course, that is being carried out by priests. And so they meet their end here under Josiah. And those that were already dead, they disinterred and burned the bones. Incline mentions that the chronicler follows his usual custom and omits the attack on the shrines of the male votaries. Uh, in other words, the male temple prostitutes as Kings here has it in verse 7. And there's debate about why consistently the chronicler omits this phrase. And some speculation is that it may look a bit too much like the term like Kedoshim and things like that, like holy ones. And so he refrains from it. It may be that this issue was not an issue in his day at all. So he just doesn't even mention it. But I do want to bring this up only because there are those and this is a bit of a sidebar issue, but there are those who would look at Leviticus 18 and 20, the same-sex prohibitions, and say that it's not about homosexuality per se. It's about temple prostitution or something. The problem with that view, well, there's a number of problems, but at least one of them is there is a term for temple prostitution. It's the one that you just saw right there in Second Kings. So they had a word for it, and it's not used there in Leviticus. So if that's what he had in view, he would have just probably use the word. I, I don't see why you wouldn't have. So it just seems like a bit of a disingenuous argument, but point is the chronicler, for whatever reasons, never brings up that term at all or that issue for that matter. And moving down to verse six, 
in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in the ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the Asherim and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. At least two things of note here. So he goes as far as these regions here, Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, and Naphtali. And there are those that question whether this could have been historically the case. And Dillard is kind of interacting with that, pointing out simply that at this point, the Assyrian Empire was crumbling. And this fact will come up throughout this narrative. And so perhaps that allowed Josiah some freedom to actually move out and perform some of the reforms in the further reaches of the empire. And the other thing to note is this sequence occurs only in Chronicles here, but it's common elsewhere. And it gives a chiastic arrangement, north, south, south, north. So you go Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, Naphtali. And it is interesting that Dan is missing um, because Dan, of course, is missing also in Revelation. That's its own separate discussion. And this phrase, in the ruins all around, in verse 6, or at the end of verse 6, has received a bit of question. And Williamson concludes, ultimately, that the most convincing emendation comes from this guy here, who reads it as, he destroyed their sanctuaries. So, it is an odd phrase, and nobody really knows what to do with it. Most people want to amend the text somewhere. And then one final note in this area, I thought this was interesting because we had mentioned this before, and Klein finally brings it up here. He says, grinding to dust recalls the way Moses took the calf that had been made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. The chronicler has this dust sprinkled, not on the graves of the common people, but on the graves of those who were sacrificing to these carved and cast images. The retribution is immediate and specific. Of course, he doesn't connect this all the way back to the jealousy inspection in Numbers 5, which I think the Moses incident, I'm not sure which is the chicken and which is the egg. I do think there's a literary connection between those two things, the jealousy inspection and the golden calf episode. And I think both are brought up very cryptically in certain places. And throughout Chronicles, we've seen this in these reformations. They tear down the images and the idols, and they often pulverize the idols and throw it into the water. Now, nobody drinks it, but you do see some of these elements. It's very interesting. And then we move down to a new section in verse 8 and following, and this is when they find the book of the law. And this is in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah. And we'll move past a lot of the nuts and bolts issues, and I want to pick up here, though, with Han. He says, the earlier biblical history explains Josiah's reform and the renewal efforts as a response to finding the book of the law in the temple. But for the chronicler, Josiah was a seeker after God from an early age. His reforms had already begun before the discovery was made. In fact, it was because he had commanded the restoration of the temple that the priest Hilkiah found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Scholars have long debated the contents of the book that Helkiah found. Interpretive options range from the entire Pentateuch to a portion of Deuteronomy. It is impossible to know with certainty. And of course, there are those very critical scholars that would actually push the argument that this is when Deuteronomy was not found, but was created. It was actually written during this period. And here it's being portrayed as it was found here. But obviously, there's no evidence of that. It's just their presupposition. And Lightheart says the repetitive structure underlines the formal ritualized character of the collection. And here he has the structure. They gave into the hands of the doers of the work and overseers of the house. They gave it to the doers of the work who did in the house to restore and strengthen the house. The ritualized pattern has a practical point. No funds are lost along the way. Everyone deals honestly and fairly so that the gifts of the people eventually get to the workmen who will maintain and mend the house. And then in verse 11 here, there's this mention here of these beams. Nobody really knows what to do with this either, but for our purposes here, this last phrase, the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. This term here, ruin, is our Passover term, um, our negative Passover term, the destroying angel, that idea. So Johnston says, 
Chronicles adds an obscure reference to roofing the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. In the context of temple renovation, the reference is likely to be to parts of the temple complex itself. The point being made is, however, a central one in Chronicles' presentation. Destroyed is the key word and refers to the negative Passover brought about by some of Josiah's predecessors. And he has here compare chapter 12 and chapter 22. And we've encountered these negative Passovers before. By Josiah's acts of renovation, the conditions are being prepared whereby the true Passover can be celebrated as is soon to be described in chapter 35. So in the next chapter, they're going to actually celebrate a positive Passover. In moving on to verses 12 and following, the men work faithfully with Levites and overseers. And then you have this kind of unusual verse, the Levites all who were skilled with instruments of music were over the burden bearers and directed all who did work in every kind of service and some of the Levites who were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. So it, it's just interesting why the sudden reference to music. And there is some speculation because it's known in the ancient world that music sometimes accompanied building projects. They were used for the purposes of rhythm. So you could have teams of people moving in unison and in collaboration. And so maybe that's what the Levites are doing here, specifically the reference to their music. Of course, the Levites are described as scribes and gatekeepers and all this other stuff. So they would have had other functions to go along with the building project, but maybe they also had a musical function that they assisted in. And then we move down to verse 14 and following, and this is when they find the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. And here Lightheart is interacting with previous scholarship on the issue. Again, is this Deuteronomy? Is it the entire Pentateuch? And as you can see, the various scholars taking different positions. And Lightheart says the former seems preferable, that is, that it's the Pentateuch. Torah appears 17 times in Chronicles, the Gematria of Kavod, glory, three times in chapter 34. Of course, it's also the value of the divine name, Yahweh, as we've noted many times in this study. Verse 15 mimics the movement of the priest into the inner sanctuary where the book of Torah is discovered. So it has the book of the law of the Lord, but of course the term here is Torah. And Lightheart here has the structuring. Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, a book of Torah I found in the house of Yahweh. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. And Lightheart continues that the book is like the money passed from hand to hand to hand until Shaphan the scribe reads it in the presence of the king, reversing the order of tribute priest, scribe, king. Josiah gives tribute to the Lord, and the word of the Lord comes down from the temple mount to warn and instruct the king. Yahweh is no longer silent. He speaks again from his throne above the cherubim. And I'm not going to read this out, but Dillard here interacts with some of these scholars who will say things like Deuteronomy is a pious fraud, you know, stuff like that written at the time of Josiah. So he's actually interacting with some of that idea but he ultimately concludes that this is very unlikely and that there's good reason to believe that there was very much either Deuteronomy or some book like Deuteronomy. And he says, we can only speculate why it would have been lost. But again, we've had series after series of bad kings show up. Apostasy is introduced, full-blown syncretism. And so that a pious priest may have hidden the book so that it wasn't destroyed that doesn't seem unlikely. That seems actually rather likely that the book would have been hidden and kept safe. And then moving down to verse 18, then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Elkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it before the king. Lightheart writes, Shaphan calls the word out to the king. So here we have read or read. He's referring to this term here and it's going to repeat throughout the following sections. But Lightheart writes that the verb underlying the interaction between prayer and Torah, prayers are called out to Yahweh and he calls back. In perfect expression of Israel's vocation, Josiah hears and mourns the sin of his people. He tears his clothes and weeps. 
sowing a tenderness of heart that Yahweh commands. I'm not sure if that should read showing. He recognizes that Judah has not kept the word of Yahweh. But Lightheart is referring to verse 19, where hearing the words, again, the Shema language, he hears the words of Torah, and he tears his clothes, and the king commanded a group to go inquire the Lord for me. For those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord, to do according to all that is written in this book. And of course, verse 21's language of to go inquire is our key vocabulary in Chronicles of Seeking. So go seek the Lord, which is what a good king should do. And Johnstone writes, confession is also implied, that humbling of oneself, which Chronicles has insisted marks the first step in restoration, and which Josiah has already shown by tearing his garments. In light of the contents of the scroll, Josiah has been brought to recognize how great the anger of the Lord must be that is poured out on them. He confesses that the fault lies with our fathers, earlier generations of the house of David, in the first instance at least, who have not kept the word of the Lord to act in accordance with all that is written in this scroll. Chronicles emphasizes the personal will of the Lord behind the objective formulation of scripture. It is because of the Lord's relation with Israel that his anger has been provoked. It is not mere obedience that he craves, but the realizing of that quality of life in harmony with himself that is Israel's destiny. It is because of this relationship that he can be consulted. Perhaps even now he may relent. So it's because the Lord is personal that disobedience is offensive, but it's also because the Lord is personal that he may respond as a person may respond. He might actually relent. He's not this disimpassioned deity that doesn't really care. This is not the deity of Epicureanism or something. But this group of people that the king sends go to Hulda, the prophetess. So in verse 22, so Hilkiah and those whom the king had sent went to Hulda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokat, son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter and spoke to her to that effect. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands, Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you have humbled yourself before me, and have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. And this is worth bringing out, the fact that, obviously, she's a prophetess, it's a female, and Lightheart here is going to offer a counter to what we encountered in the last chapter. So I pointed out that there was no queen mother formula and that would continue through the rest of Chronicles. And I pointed out that it made probably the most sense that it was simply the sources changing and they didn't carry that information. But Lightheart is going to offer a theological reflection on this. He writes, he, that is Josiah, does right even though there is no maternal guide. And here he points out again, the absence of this queen mother formula. Though unstated, the implication is that the king's mother exercised a godly influence on her son. There are counterexamples. 
is asked to remove his mother from her position because she makes an Asherah. Athaliah, the wife of Jehoram, influences her husband and son to walk in the way of Ahab until she is defeated by the bold action of a godly mother, Jehoshabeth. After Hezekiah, mothers good and bad drop out of the picture. The chronicler's omission is deliberate. So here, Lightheart disagrees. Since the mother's names appear in 2 Kings, his source text. And that is rather interesting because, of course, Kings does carry on that information. But a woman plays a significant role during Josiah's reign. Huldah the prophetess, who has the longest speaking part of any woman in Chronicles and is the last woman in Chronicles. She is a mother in Israel, even if she is not related to Josiah. I smell allegory given the imagery of Mother Israel or Mother Jerusalem, as well as the proverbial figure of Lady Wisdom. The absence of mothers signals the loss of the guiding hand of wisdom. And so that's an interesting counterpoint that I figured I should throw in there for the sake of balance. And worth mentioning here is this language of keeper of the wardrobe. Again, there's a lot of discussion and there's no real consensus on this. But Johnston writes, her husband, though he plays no further part in the narrative, is given some prominence and that prominence must have some significance. He is described as keeper of the garments, a title which occurs only in this context. One is left to surmise that the garments are those worn by the priest, not least the high priest. And here Johnstone lists out the various garments. If so, it is easy to imagine the commitment to the tradition of Moses and the law of such a person whose daily task is to handle elaborate vestments with such powerful symbolism of Israel's dedication to God and to care for the changes of garment during the rites of national whole burnt offerings and atonement. His role must surely also imply Levitical status. And that may be why he is given a pedigree extending back for two generations. Again, genealogy functioning as legitimation of claim to standing. And he compares this to Second Chronicles 2014. And that's when Jehaziel is given this mini biography. A connection between the wife of this key figure in the cult, ritual and liturgy, and the book of the law found in the temple becomes comprehensible, as does her sense of prophetic outrage at the violation of practice and of God's rights. And this makes quite a lot of sense, especially given the fact that immediately Josiah knows to seek these people out specifically. So they probably had some pretty high standing. And also of note is this phrase, the second quarter. It's uh, known only in this context and Zephaniah 1.10 implies a secondary development of Jerusalem, probably the expansion of to the western hill of the city to accommodate in these unsettled times, an increased population of Judeans or of refugees, including Levites from the north. So after the fall of the north, you would have had a number of refugees flocking back to Judah. And so they likely had to expand. And this would presumably be where these people lived. And I thought this was rather interesting here. Uh, Lightheart is commenting on this oracle, and it's a modified chiasm, but that slight modification seems to have a theological import here. So you have, tell Josiah, and this is how the oracle begins. It's mirrored here by, to the king of Judah, verse 26, I bring evil and curses mirrored by the very end. You will not see evil. And see, they have forsaken me. And then see prime, because you have heard and humbled yourself, I will gather you. So though the people have forsaken the Lord, the king hasn't. He has humbled himself. And then usually at the center is the most important part of the chiasm. But here you have, my wrath will be poured out. And that's rather interesting because as Lightheart notes here, Josiah will be spared the evil that the Lord is bringing. But the threat remains. There is no resolution to the central pronouncement. My wrath will be poured out on this place and it shall not be quenched. So given the way that he sets up this chiasm, there's nothing here mediating the wrath. The wrath is going to happen. It's just not going to happen directly in the time of Josiah. 
because he humbles himself. And to round things off here, you have this emphasis on hearing. Of course, Josiah hears. This is our very important Shema language. So she says, concerning or regarding the words that you have heard. And then she continues, you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words. And because of this, I, that is God, also have heard you, declares the Lord. So hear the words of the Lord, humble yourself, and the Lord will hear you. And this fits very much with Solomon's prayer that has been coming up over and over here in these last few chapters. But the last item of interest is concerning this prophecy itself, because ultimately, spoiler alert, Josiah is going to die, and he's going to die on the field of battle. So how do you fit that with the idea that he's supposedly going to die in peace? And there's a couple of ways in which this is discussed and taken, but we will begin with Dillard. He says, to suggest that Holda's original prophecy was unfulfilled or an error would have been anathema to the compilers of kings who repeatedly used the fulfillment of prophetic pronouncements to confirm the efficacy of the prophetic word. Of course, kings has this, and they have no problem with this. It is hardly probable that such a lapse would escape editorial excision in kings, much less also survive the chronicler. So both kings and chronicles have this prophecy. They have Josiah dying, so apparently they didn't sense attention. And Dillard continues, a more natural understanding does not require literary critical effort. The compilers of Kings and Chronicles apparently understood the first half of Holda's prophecy, going to his grave in peace as defined by the second half, not seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. The analogy of Ahab may be helpful. His repentance forestalled the end of his dynasty, but it did not avert his own violent death. Compare also Hezekiah. So this is one way that I think actually works very easily because that is the ultimate issue at the heart of Josiah's seeking the guidance of the prophet and the prophet's own oracle. It focuses on the city and on the inhabitants and things like that. And so it would make sense that she's saying, ultimately, you're going to die before the city falls and all these terrible consequences happen, which of course is the case. So that's one way of looking at it. And another way would be the way Johnstone takes it, which is also very simple. He says the crisis will be averted in his time. So that's kind of like what Dillard said, but he continues, he will die in peace. In light of the sequel, it is clear that this word is conditional. The promise of a long and happy life is no more unconditional than is the promise to David that his successor will sit on his throne in perpetuity or that the people will continue to inhabit the land. Chronicles insistently adds here and on its inhabitants to align this verse with verse 24. Josiah is about to forfeit that promise through his inability to rely on the affirmations of his theology in the face of the advance of the Egyptian king. So that's another way to take this is that it's merely conditional. But Josiah brings this disaster on himself, which itself carries something of an irony in that he is gathered to his grave in peace. That's the prophecy. Of course, the chronicler is going to make it clear that he actually makes it back to Jerusalem where he dies. Whereas in Kings, it, it gives the impression that he dies there at Megiddo on the field of battle. Of course, Jerusalem carries with it echoes of shalom, of peace. And so there may be a, um, a bitter play on words there. And so Josiah, moving down to verse 29 and following, is going to gather together all the people, the elders, as well as the inhabitants, priests, Levites, the people, great and small, to hear the words of the Book of the Covenant. It should be noted that the elders had dropped out of the picture basically entirely since the time of Rehoboam, and here they reemerge. But concerning this language of great and small, Han writes, he gathers all the people, both great and small, in the temple to hear the law read and to renew their covenant with God. The scene is decidedly reminiscent of Moses' gathering of the people to hear the law at Sinai. There, too, the elders are present, together with all the people. Moses read 
in their hearing the book of the covenant. So Josiah read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant. At both Sinai and Jerusalem, the people enter into a covenant to do all the words they have heard. And the chronicler tells us that all in Israel served the Lord their God and did not depart from this covenant for as long as Josiah was king. And again, that seems to go very well with the prophecy we just read. So as long as Josiah was there, they forestalled the judgment. And here in verse 31, we have this language that the king stood in his place. And Johnstone says, Hezekiah stands on or beside his position, which is likely to be identical with the place where Joash stood in Second Chronicles 23, 13. So maybe the same general location. And I thought this was interesting here. Lightheart writes that he, that is Josiah, becomes simply the king, a living archetype of sheer royalty. His proper name is used 14 times in chapter 15 and 17 times total in 33.25 through 36.1. He does everything that one expects of a king and he serves the function of king as the incarnation of his people. But what he's commenting on is the fact that his name kind of drops out for a bit in this section and he simply, again, becomes the king. And then verse 33 And Josiah took all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. And Dillard writes, this verse is a summary statement and forms somewhat of an inclusio with 34, 6 through 7. As a summary, it also suggests that the writer is departing from following kings as his forelog, his template, and is turning to another source from which he will draw details regarding Josiah's observance of Passover in the next chapter, in chapter 35, which begins immediately following this section. And as we move down to chapter 35, Josiah is going to keep the Passover after his various reformation projects in Jerusalem. And as we saw last time, we had this mirroring structure between chapter 34 and chapter 35. So the Passover, again, is going to mirror the Reformation. We're going to have the prophetic word of Nico mirroring the prophetic word of the prophetess. And then we're going to have here a failure to listen to that divine word. And Josiah is going to die. Of course, that is mirrored by the positive hearing of the words of the prophet, the renewal of the covenant. And so verse 1 reads, Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month. He appointed the priests to their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. And we'll break off there to note a couple of things straight away. First off, this entire chapter is interesting because, as we saw last time, we had two smaller sections being governed by the divine number 17, and both of those sections combined were also governed by 17. Well, here we're going to get the same thing, except this time it's 26. So verses 1 through 7 are sectioned by a paragraph break, and there are 104 words, or 4 times 26. Verses 8 through 18 also divided by a paragraph break, are 7 times 26 words. The entire section, verses 1 through 18, the preparation and celebration of the Passover, are 286 words, or 11 times 26. So that's really interesting. So in chapter 34, we get 17 structuring these two sections, and this time we get 26 structuring these two sections. And it should be noted here in verse 2, when Josiah appoints the priest to their offices and he encouraged them, that is our HZQ root to make strong, to establish. And this is going to be the last occurrence. Nothing else is established or made strong for the rest of the work. But moving down to verses three and following, Josiah is going to set the ark in the temple. Of course, that's kind of a 
curiosity because wasn't it already in the temple? Didn't David and Solomon essentially do that? And ultimately, the answer is yes. In fact, we'll just go ahead and take a look at what some of the commentators say. So Johnstone says, the writing is probably highly ideological. It is likely that, along the lines of his timeless contemporaneity, Chronicles is presenting Josiah's action as a rerun, that is, a reaffirmation of what was achieved under Solomon. What Solomon did, Josiah does. Solomon is given a list of sonorous titles, son of David, king of Israel, to emphasize the authority behind the action and to indicate that by his action, Josiah is truly expressing his role as Davidic monarch in that succession. Three times in this chapter, the authority of David is invoked, verses 3, 4, and 15. The description of the ark as the holy ark, unique in the Hebrew Bible, let alone Chronicles, perhaps also reflects the view that its sole appropriate location is the holy of holies in the temple. But moving down to verses 4 and following, they're going to prepare themselves, that is the priests, and stand in the holy place according to their groupings of their father's houses, of your brothers and the lay people, and so on and so forth. This language here of the lay people, and this is what John Stone is getting at, he says, those who are termed brothers are described by an unusual expression, the sons of the people, four times in this chapter which occurs elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible in context indicating fringe members of society of little account or of dubious orthodoxy. This Passover is an expression of community solidarity from which not even the poorest and least regarded members are excluded. And then moving down to verse 7, then Josiah contributed to the lay people as Passover offerings for all who were present lambs and young goats from the flock to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bulls. These were from the king's possessions. And so you have the king also contributing to the lay people. And Johnstone comments on this, as the righteous king like David, Solomon, and Hezekiah, Josiah supplies from his own estate the Passover victims that enable people to fulfill their obligations. The royal estates are not private property but the means whereby the power and prosperity of Israel as the Lord's hosts focus on the Lord's anointed are expressed. That's very interesting. So in other words, the king is not enriching himself to the exclusion of his people. His wealth is an expression of the wealth of the Lord, and so it goes back to the people. And in this case, by way of his contributing to the Passover so that they can celebrate. And then moving down to verse 8 and following, similarly, the officials contributed willingly to the people, to the priests, and to the Levites. And then we're going to get to a mini roll call here of various peoples and their contributions. And then verse 12 and following gets into a curiosity here. And here's the interesting part. And they roasted the Passover lamb with fire according to the rule. And they boiled the holy offerings in pots and in cauldrons and in pans and carried them quickly to all the lay people. And so there's actually quite a bit that's been written about this issue. And so this isn't technically a whole burnt offering. So it shouldn't be taken that way because they're going to eat part of this. So the whole thing is not going up. So this is why you get things like this, the the parts to be burnt. And so that's what they're interacting with. That's part of it. But there's another part that's of interest, this language here of roasted or boiled. And so Johnson says, verses 11b through 13, then explain how the Passover treated as a communion sacrifice is observed with the utmost punctiliousness. The meal is, as is required, shared three ways. The appropriate parts are burnt on the altar to God. So one part goes to God. The other appropriate parts are given as their due to the priests. So this is part of the priest's payment, so to speak, is they eat part of the meal. And then the remainder is available to the sacrificer and his household and, if need be, his neighbors. And so the sacrifice goes in three ways to be shared as a meal. And I went ahead and included this note here by John Stone again. He says, one must assume that as the blood equates with life, that's Leviticus 17, 14. It has a phrase, something like the life is in the blood or something to that effect. It's dashed against the altar. So the fat portions are burnt 
on the altar because they represent vitality and are thus returned to God, the giver of life. But I throw this in here because the truth is nobody really knows what to do exactly with certain fat portions that are not to be eaten. And so there's quite a bit of debate on that. Mary Douglas, who I've mentioned a couple times on this channel, specifically in the context of these tripartite divisions that you get with like the temple and whatnot, I alluded to this. I'm not sure if I alluded to this aspect of it, but she points out that the sacrifice itself has something of a tripartite division in how it was offered. And she believes that the fat corresponds to the veils, basically. So you have the temple precincts or Mount Sinai with the clouds, but we'll look at the temple or the tabernacle or whatever. They had these veils that would separate the sections so that you couldn't see into the next section. And she equates the fat with that, with the veil. And so you don't eat the veil, basically. So that would be perhaps why they don't eat these particular fat portions. Returning back to the broader issue, here Dillard has a nice summary of specifically this issue with the roasted versus boiled thing. So again, if our term here has only the meaning boil, then the phrase boil in the fire would be a curious and incongruous conflation of Exodus 12, 8 through 9 and Deuteronomy 16, 7. And we'll go ahead and just take a look at this so you know what's going on. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted. It's head with its legs and its inner parts. So here, do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roasted. So don't boil it. And then in Deuteronomy 16, 7, you shall cook it and eat it in the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning, you shall turn and go to your tents. And the term here, cook, is the term that we're looking at here. And so there are those that would hold these passages in something of a deep tension. And so some actually take this language as being something of an attempt to make sense of these two seemingly contradictory um, statements. But as he points out, that this term here appears rather to be a more general term for food preparation. Its precise significance depending on the context. So in 2 Samuel 13, 8, he lists here, you have Tamar who's cooking and she takes dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. So it's this term here, baked. She doesn't boil it. She doesn't roast it. She bakes them. And so it seems to be a generic food preparation term. Maybe cook is the simplest term we might use. And Dillard continues, in this case, no tension would exist between Deuteronomy and Exodus regarding the means of preparing the Passover animal. The chronicler may be integrating terminology from both passages, but the semantic incongruity would not be there. The cooking would be in accord with custom, i.e. in fire without water. So although these terms are actually the same and they get translated differently, it may simply just be a generic food preparation term. And so in verse 14, the priests and the Levites continue the offerings until night. So the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests and the sons of Aaron. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place according to the command of David. And Asaph and Heman and Jedithan, the king's seer, and the gatekeepers were at each gate. They did not need to depart from their service for their brothers the Levites prepared for them. And this verse has some pretty far-reaching touch points in Chronicles. The institution of the singers and the gatekeepers and these particular Levitical clans. And moving down to verse 16, so all the service of the Lord was prepared that day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord, according to the command of King Josiah. And the people of Israel who were present kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. No Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. None of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as was kept by Josiah. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, this Passover was kept. 
Now, of course, Hezekiah had his own Passover celebration that was on a grandest scale. And it would seem that the sense in which this Passover was unprecedented was in its keeping the Passover to the letter. Because remember, Hezekiah's, they cut some corners because they had to, but this time they don't. And so Klein is going to make this point. He says, with this verse, the chronicler returns to his forelock, his uh, template in Kings, though he also made changes in the words taken from that text. Again, we just looked at some of that stuff. So what is it specifically about this Passover that was unique? He says, rather, it was the way Josiah's Passover was done on the right day and in precisely the right way. Note especially the prominent role of the Levites, which resulted from Josiah's mandate. And we'll close out this section here with a note from Han. He says, this will be the final account of temple worship in Chronicles. Indeed, the temple will be destroyed in the very next chapter. The Passover is preceded by Josiah's address to the Levites. And so a place, the temple, that is so central to Chronicles theology is going to fade out from view from this point on. And with the Passover celebrated, things are going to take a dramatic turn. And beginning at verse 20, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. And Josiah went out to meet him. But he sent envoys to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I am not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot, and carried him in his second chariot, and brought him to Jerusalem. And he died and was buried in the tombs of his fathers. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And we'll break it off there. There's quite a bit to discuss in this section. We'll begin here with Williamson. He says, The question of the historical reliability of the chronicler's version of events has naturally loomed at large in scholarly discussion. A solution will always depend in part upon the interpretation of the king's account, for there continues to be a minority opinion which thinks that it does not intend to record a battle at Megiddo in the first place. More generally, however, it has been accepted since the publication of the Babylonian Chronicle that the chronicler was dependent upon a reliable account, which in fact even corrects one misleading point of detail in Kings. And I think he's referring here to the, what exactly Nico is doing at Carchemish. But Williamson continues that attention should be drawn to recent work done. And here he lists you know, the source of this study. And he concludes, the account in Chronicles dovetails nicely with this reconstruction. While this does not amount to a demonstration of its reliability, it provides an additional pointer in that direction. So again, in the older bygone era, you would see those that would say this is an example of the chronicler using free composition, quote unquote. In other words, he's just making stuff up. But the comparative historical material actually as he says, dovetails very nicely with what we've been finding out. So people actually think, no, that this actually does seem to make sense. And if anything, it doesn't seem to be the chronicler that has any issues. If there are issues, it would seem to be in the king's account. So the chronicler would seem to actually be drawing on some genuine historical sources. But that's neither here nor there for my purpose. I, I like to take the accounts as received, as given to us. And so we look at it more from a theological perspective. And on that note, Lightheart writes of this, when all is said and done, some are back under the hand of Egypt. Judah loses the land, the temple, and all the spoils of Egypt that are plundered by Babylon. The exodus and the conquest have been reversed. All that Israel received and achieved unravels. Judah's history ends where it began, 
Israel among Gentiles, Josiah at Megiddo dying like Saul, a victim of Egypt as Saul was a victim of the second tier Egypt of Philistia. And remember that the Philistines are connected to the Egyptians in Chronicles. Lightheart continues, Israel is ready for a second exodus, ready for a new Moses and a new David who comes in the surprising shape of Cyrus of Persia. Of course, that's in the next chapter. And here concerning the Megiddo aspect, Lightheart writes, Josiah's death is a reverse exodus because it is first an inverted Passover. And remember, we just celebrated the Passover. Zechariah describes a scene of mourning like the mourning in the plain of Megiddo, a reference to the death of Josiah in Zechariah 12, 11. But the mourning Zechariah describes is also like the mourning of Egypt over their firstborn. At the first Passover, the firstborn of Egypt died. Here, the firstborn of Israel, the king, dies. In fact, the king is Yahweh's son. In this reverse Passover, Yahweh's own son is slain, the royal son who embodies Yahweh's son Israel. And of course, this has heavy messianic implications. Of course, Zechariah is taken precisely in that way. And Dillard here is noting as do many of the other commentators as well, is that there's this influence in the chronicler's account here that it seems as if it's telling this narrative through the lens of Ahab as well as Ahaziah. So it was influenced by their deaths and the way that they're told. All three kings died after fleeing the field of battle in their chariots. Ahab and Josiah both had gone into battle disguised. Both were wounded by archers and both instructed subordinates to remove them from the battlefield. And Johnstone, commenting on this, is noting this common motif that we've come across where we have these reformations, they're at the peak of orthodoxy, and then you have interaction with the outside world, recognition by the world of the nations. But as Johnstone points out, instead of that new recognition, Chronicles has now to turn to trace how Despite all these reforms and the expectations they must arouse, Josiah, almost immediately, it seems, but chronologically, it is 13 years later, is killed and leaves his people at the mercy of the Egyptians. How can these things have happened? And before we move any further, again, we'll look at Dillard's comment here. We've noted, especially in the better times for Israel, that they had this unique position geographically. And so that helps them economically, but of course, they're also going to be in the path of where armies are marching through. So in expanded conquests, they're going to get caught up in the crossfire, so to speak. And so as the Assyrian Empire is crumbling, that leaves the old powers of Egypt and Babylon now unchecked, now themselves growing back into the powers they once were. And these events were full of ominous portent for Judah. And I rather like this observation here by John Stone, commenting on the end of verse 20. The ESV has Josiah went out to meet him. And John Stone says, with a third terse phrase, Chronicles adds, Josiah advanced to meet him. The words are laden with meeting. To advance is the verb Chronicle uses as early as 1 Chronicles 1.12. So 12 verses into Chronicle's work. He uses this word to describe the onslaught of the nations. In that case, specifically the Philistines, but within the wider context of Cush and Nimrod, of verse 10. So he's referring to this right here, from whom the Philistines came. And so this language carries with it resonances, not just of descent, but of the idea of expansion of invasion in his noting again this connection back to Cush who fathered Nimrod but back to Johnstone he says it is precisely between Cush and Nimrod the rival powers of the earth of west and east that Josiah is caught at this moment in continuing further down with Johnstone he says Josiah sallying forth to intercept the Egyptian king is as ill-conceived and ill-fated as the venturing forth 
of predecessors of Josiah's into the international arena. Rehoboam's going to Shechem, Asa's hiring of Ben-Hadad, Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab, Ahaziah's alliance with Jehoram, Amaziah's challenge to Joash, Ahaz's appeal to tiglath Pilnazar the third, Hezekiah's entertainment of the Babylonian spies. In each of these cases, the fault is the compromising of Jerusalem theology. The Lord is enthroned as cosmic ruler, and his Davidic king in Zion is his agent among the nations of the earth. The Lord's ark is at rest in the Holy of Holies. The resting of that ark symbolizes the pacification of the nations of the world. It is that fundamental theological statement that Josiah himself has just reaffirmed by his instruction to the Levites in verse 3, that there is now no need to transport the ark. Josiah's failure is that he ignores the reaffirmation of the pacification imposed by God, represented by the ark, at rest just lately permanently installed at his own instruction in the temple. And so the point is, if Josiah is faithful to the promises of God, he's going to understand that he does not need to involve himself in the matters of the other nations. He can stand firm knowing that the Lord is with them, is on their side. And it should be noted in verse 21 that when he sends envoys to him saying, what have we to do with each other, that that term there, envoys, is actually the term messengers, Malachim. And so Johnstone says that there is yet a further irony. In situation after situation of crisis, God has sent his prophetic figures to warn. Here is the ultimate irony. It is these messengers, one of the traditional titles of God's own prophets, of Israel's longest standing traditional enemy who convey the word of salvation to God's own people. Once again, God has not left himself without a witness. But Josiah refuses to heed the warning. Like the defiant yet profoundly insecure Ahab, he disguises himself for the battle as though by that act he could escape the determinate purpose of God. He points out here parenthetically that there are those that want to amend the text or instead of disguising himself, he's determining to fight with him. And concerning the fact that the word of the Lord comes from Nico. Klein writes, his refusal to listen to the words of Nico from the mouth of God provides a theological rationale for Josiah's death. Missing the space there. A rationale that is so clearly lacking in Kings. Now in Chronicles, he also disguises himself as Ahab had done. Following the role model of this evil northern king, no doubt shows the severity of Josiah's sin. And he also alludes, of course, to this question about the reading there about disguising himself. And in the footnote, there's a lot of interaction with this idea of the disguises used throughout scripture. And that actually was not the note that I thought I was reading because I wanted this one by Diller. He says, rather than finding it improbable that Nico would explain his own movements theologically, to the contrary, we should consider it quite probable. It appears to have been common practice to allege the favor and beneficence of an opponent's deity, as was done by Sennacherib's emissaries. The Assyrians routinely claimed that local deities controlling the destinies of their adherents acted on behalf of Assyria. The surprising element in this account is not the theological rationalization on the part of the Egyptian pharaoh, but rather that the chronicler would view his protestations as genuinely a divine message to Josiah. And Klein similarly agrees that clearly the referent here is to God, that is to Yahweh. So there is a genuine message being given to Josiah. And Johnson writes down here, to resist him, that is Nico, is to resist God. Then with the words that add the full pathos to the confrontation, Nico adds, lest he destroy you. Here is the basic vocabulary of the negative Passover. In the original Exodus from Egypt, God had sent the destroyer to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians so that Israel, his firstborn, might be delivered. Now in the mouths of Egyptians, the same vocabulary is used. If Josiah does not heed the warning issued by God through the Egyptians, he will bring down upon his own people the very destruction by God from which it was the purpose of the exodus to deliver them.
And so this passage is just full of irony on this fact, as well as, again, this is the Passover that this is referencing, the celebration they just completed in the narrative. And Han is going to similarly echo these ideas. He writes, immediately following this glorious Passover, Josiah's faith is tested. Without provocation, Josiah decides to engage the Egyptian pharaoh Nico in battle, despite assurances from Nico that he is not marching against Judah. The scene is filled with ironies. The pharaoh of Egypt, the original mortal enemy of Israel, here plays the part of God's messenger. Cease opposing God who was with me, of course that's Emmanuel type language, lest he destroy you. Nico's warning deliberately evokes the night of the first Passover. Indeed, the Passover was intended to protect Israel from the destroyer, sent by God to slay all the firstborn in Egypt. But Josiah does not listen to the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and he is destroyed in the battle he had no reason to fight. It is a swift, anticlimactic, and disconcerting ending to the reign of a good king and a true son of David. The king who more than any other is associated with the word of God and who was so zealous for its interpretation is struck down for failing to heed that word. And concerning verse 24, Dillard writes, The chronicler is at pains to show that they brought him to Jerusalem and he died. Williamson regards this modification in Chronicles as the author's effort to ease the difficulty with Holda's prophecy that Josiah would go to his grave in peace, though the chronicler provides no hint of this intent in the immediate context. And we discussed this earlier, and I agreed there with Diller to that. I just don't see the tension. I, I think that on one hand, again, you could do what Johnstone did and say that it was conditional or that the prophecy was about the fall of Jerusalem and that he would not see it in his days. So I really don't think that this is what's going on exactly here. And Dillard continues that Gray harmonizes second Kings with this passage in Chronicles by translating the King's passage in 2320 or 2330. His retainers drove him dying from Megiddo. Compare Rudolph and compare the similar question regarding the place of death in the case of Ahaziah and Jehoiakim. The change to a second chariot was probably an effort to provide comfort or space for the recumbent king. In concerning the difference, Johnstone says, in Kings, Josiah dies at Megiddo itself. Chronicles has modified the tradition to make a significant point. He who should have reigned victoriously seated on the Lord's throne in Jerusalem is instead brought back there in powerlessness because of his failure to rely on on his own theological tradition, to perish at the very site of his loftiest claims. And we'll close out with this note by Johnstone. He says, Josiah is the last of the kings of Judah to be buried in Jerusalem, according to Chronicles' presentation. The period of independence of the house of David is at an end. The following kings are installed and removed by Egypt or Babylon and all die in exile. The exile has effectively begun. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem are in mourning for Josiah and for all that his death must now mark in the history of his people. By the notice of the burial in verse 24, Chronicles has promoted item 6 of the standard framework out of its due position. By this very change in the framework, Chronicles is signaling that a radical break has now occurred in the presentation of the monarchy. The Masoretic text confirms this break by the strong paragraph marker inserted at the end of verse 24, and by the way in which the next paragraph is defined as running from verse 25 to verse 4 of the next chapter, the account of kings who die in exile has now begun. And so in verse 25, Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah, and all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah and their laments to this day. And they made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. And so you have this repeated use of this term. Of course, there's question about whether this is in some way related to the book of Lamentations by Jeremiah. And Johnstone writes that it's uncertain. Of course, all the commentators agree that no one really knows for sure. But Johnstone writes, it is notable. Lamentations concerns rather the fall of Jerusalem 
the references to monarchy are relatively, perhaps even surprisingly, few. The basis of hope is, however, shared whatever the literary connection may in fact be or not be. The throne is the throne of the Lord. Lamentations at the very least contains examples of the genre, if not the very words composed in response to the death of Josiah. So short answer, nobody really knows. But this is rather interesting, though, that it doesn't really follow so much the monarchy. It's more so about the fall of Jerusalem. And again, this highlighted fact that the Davidic throne is the throne of God. And of course, this really should mentally take us back to First Chronicles 17, where the temple, the house of the Lord, is first brought up. And that dually nature of the house of the Lord and the house of David, the Davidic son, Solomon, would build a house for the Lord, and the Lord would build a house for David, which meant a son, the lineage of the Davidic king. But of course, both of those houses ultimately get merged in Christ, who is the son of David, but is also the heavenly tabernacle come down to earth. And so really all of this stuff should be seen, I think, through the messianic lens. Of course, Josiah specifically, you know, he's the one that's mentioned in Zechariah, who they pierced. And in fact, I have a quote here from Bill's commentary, his Revelation commentary in Heiser's Unseen Realm, which goes into that material on Megiddo. And so there's this deep eschatological aspect to Josiah's death at this location. But with Josiah's failure to listen to the words of the Lord coming in the most unlikely messenger imaginable, an Egyptian pharaoh, Josiah does not Shema, and he loses his life. And from here, it's a freefall for the monarchy and the people of God, who at this point are going to fall into complete apostasy. And so here in John Stone's commentary, this is kind of a roadmap of the end of this section. We have that transition period from the death of Josiah to Jehoahaz. And then quickly, we go to Jehoiakim, Jehoiakin, Zedekiah, and then the call to immigration, that final decree of Cyrus. But we will look, I think, first with Lightheart. He says, Josiah's death is the end of a phase of history for Judah. After this point, Gentile rulers from Egypt, Babylon, or Persia rule over the people of God. Judah's history does not end immediately, but its independence is all but over. The chronicler treats the death of Josiah as the effective end of the kingdom of Judah. And Lightheart is going to continue. He's going to point out this rapid decaying of the kingdom. They're going to burn through the next couple of kings. Lightheart writes, Saul and his sons die at Mount Gilboa on the same day. The entire royal house collapses at once. So Saul and his three sons, so all four corners of the house. Josiah dies like a Saul, but the Davidic dynasty persists for another two generations. Yet the logic is the same. Three of Josiah's sons take the throne. As so often in Chronicles, disobedience to the word of the Lord sets the clock back. Josiah's refusal to hear Yahweh's word through Nico takes us back to the beginning of the story, the collapse of Saul's dynasty. In this final section, as Klein points out, the chronicler does not report the death of any of the last four kings of Judah. As Japheth notes, once a king leaves the borders of Israel, he is no longer interesting to the chronicler. So he just kind of evaporates from the narrative. And so we'll begin with verse 1. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. The wording here is kind of interesting that it's the people of the land that make him king. But Johnstone writes, it is not made clear whether the reason for the choice was merely palace intrigue or because he was regarded as the more nationalist of the two. Certainly Jehoahaz is immediately forcibly removed by the Egyptians, which would support the latter view. So in verse two, we find out that the 23 year old only reigned for three months. And then the king of Egypt deposed him and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver, 
and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. And what's interesting here is this tribute. Klein points out that the chronicler did not include 2 Kings 23.35, which says that Jehoiakim taxed the people of the land for this tribute money. And then he asks rhetorically, was this a fine imposed on them for having supported Jehoahaz over him as king? And perhaps that is indeed the case. Now concerning the name Jehoiakim, Johnstone writes, in the verbal element in Jehoiakim's name, he shall establish. There is a melancholy play on the verb to establish. That was part of the Lord's promise to David to perpetuate his descendants on the throne after him, a promise renewed through Solomon. Nothing could more sharply underline the conditional nature of the promise to the monarchy than the fate of the bearer of this name and of his sons about to be noted. Meanwhile, Jehoahaz, as the first in line, is removed as a captive to Egypt. And so he bears a deeply ironic name. And here, Johnstone writes, The story of Israel now passes from monarchy to exile. Israel's life had started in Egypt. To Egypt, in the last word of verse 4, its first exiled monarch returns. And then moving down to verse 5 and following, Jehoiakim is 25 when he begins to reign. He reigns 11 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And then verse 6, against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. And he also carried part of the vessels of the house and put them in the palace in Babylon. And then rule is going to fall to his son, Jehoiakim, but concerning this, Johnston says, again, Chronicles provides no international military or political explanation for the change of overlord. Parenthetically, he points out that the final victory of Babylon over Assyria, followed by successes on the field of battle by the Babylonians over the Egyptians, notably at Carchemish in 605, which opened the way for Babylonian sovereignty over Syria and Palestine. These events are alluded to in 2 Kings 24. 1 and 2 in verse 7. For Chronicles, all is sufficiently explained in terms of the fact that Jehoiakim did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. In what way he did evil is not divulged. Verse 8 includes simply the conventionalized abominations, such as were practiced under Ahaz and subsequent kings. So the point is, for the chronicler, it doesn't even matter what's going on around them in the sense that these are all just instruments that the Lord is using to punish the rebellious house committing these abominations. And then in verse 9, we get to an oddity. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months and 10 days in Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, what's odd about this is that's actually not what the Hebrew text has. It actually says he was eight years old. When he became king, of course, that then raises the question of exactly how much evil could an eight-year-old do in the sight of the Lord. But this is actually a really good instance of a scribal error. And so there was very likely a very, very early scribal error in the case of the chronicler, because the parallel in Second Kings is 18 years old. And so the issue here, as Klein is pointing out in one of his footnotes, that the MT has lost the word, and here would be 10, basically. So you would have 8 and 10 years. Of course, the 10 is lost, so he just becomes 8 years old here in Chronicles. But Klein continues, an attempt to add the word 10 was entered after three months later in the verse. And so what you probably had was a scribe notice that something was off, or they noted that the 10 was missing, and so they probably wrote it in the margin. And then a later scribe comes along, sees the 10 in the margin, and accidentally places the 10 into the reign length rather than his age. So it becomes three months and 10 days instead of eight and 10 years. 
but completely a nuts and bolts type issue. But it is one of those things where you will come across this kind of stuff and it's really not a big deal, especially in a case like this where it's very obvious what's probably happening and what probably happened. But nevertheless, Joy Akin has this very short reign of three months. And in verse 10, in the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. And Johnstone notes here that once more a king is crowned by the local choice, the younger of two brothers, once more just when there might have been thought of independence regained, the overlord intervenes to deport the king and appoints his older brother in his place as king over Judah and Jerusalem. And so Zedekiah in verse 11 is 21 years old. He reigns 11 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. And that's our Ma'al language doubled up here. Following the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. And Lightheart writes that the unifying character of Second Chronicles 35 and 36 is not a king, whether Judahite or Gentile, it is a prophet, Jeremiah. He chants a lament at Josiah's death and prophesies to the stiff-necked Zedekiah. Exile comes as a fulfillment of Yahweh's word through Jeremiah, and so does a return from exile. So as we approach the end, suddenly Jeremiah begins kind of dominating the conversation. And Williamson similarly notes that the chronicler will here have been dependent on the many passages in the book of Jeremiah which treat the prophets dealing with Zedekiah. Compare especially Jeremiah 37 two. And he notes that Jeremiah frequently urged the surrender of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. The next verse demonstrates how Zedekiah rejected this advice. And Williamson continues, It is made particularly clear in Ezekiel 17, 11 through 21 that Zedekiah was in a covenant relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. His rebellion thus involved contradicting his oath sworn in God's name. He stiffened his neck, thus Jeremiah frequently condemns his contemporaries. And likewise, this language of turning to the Lord is another of Jeremiah's key phrase language. So here in this last chapter, the chronicler is picking up heavy Jeremiah type language. And we'll pick up with Johnstone here. He says the deeper level is failure to trust in God. That failure is not this time expressed in terms of Jerusalem theology. More fundamentally still, it is couched in terms of resisting the law, specifically stiffening the neck, as in, for example, Exodus 32.9 and Deuteronomy 10.16. This failure on Zedekiah's part is then defined in Chronicles' classic terms of Ma'al. The stiffening of the neck and the refusal to repent have both been already related to Ma'al in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8. And we're going to get a little bit of this definition specifically of the Ma'al language at the very end of this section and consequently at the end of the book. It's going to kind of get a, another spin on what exactly this Ma'al is. And down to verse 15, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. And Johnstone has a nice summary of this. He says, Chronicles does not record the personal fate of Zedekiah. He is not even mentioned after this point. It is the destiny of the people that is Chronicles' ultimate concern. First, the divine long-suffering is emphasized. It is because of the pity for his people and for his dwelling place that the Lord, the God of their fathers, has sent 
at earliest opportunity and continually his profits. And parenthetically, he points out that the verb pity or mercy or however this is going to be translated because he had compassion on his people. The verb is used only here and in verse 17 in Chronicles. And continuing with John Stone, he says, but equally continually, the people have been ridiculing the Lord's messengers until his anger has been provoked past the point of recovery. And he's referring here to this last line, until there was no remedy, healing that is restoration after acknowledgement of sin. And so in Solomon's prayer here, verse 14 specifically, if the people humble themselves, pray and seek the face, then the Lord will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So it's this underlying terminology here. But at this point, the apostasy is so great that there's now no longer any remedy available to them. And so in verse 17 and following, the Lord brings up the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and of the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes and all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. And he took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. There's quite a bit to discuss here. First, we'll begin here. You have the sudden emphasis on all, which actually goes up earlier to verse 14. And so I write here that in verse 14, all the officers of the priests and the people, ma'al a ma'al, right? This is that sacrilege language. They were very unfaithful or however that was translated back there, following all the abominations of the nations. This looks forward to verse 17, where Yahweh gave them all into his hand, and not only the people, but likewise, the various objects, the vessels, the treasures, everything is given over to Babylon. And picking up on some of this language, Johnstone notes that the point is made once again in verse 19, with all sharpness, using the alternative language of the negative Passover. And so specifically, he's referring to this destroyed language. Destruction, the disaster that the original Passover was designed to avert, stands now in climactic position. All security is destroyed. The fundamental security offered by God, sacramentally represented by the temple and the defenses of the city and by the wealth of its possessions. The question of security, which had dominated the reign of the first king after Solomon is now posed in ultimate terms. And so after the negative Passover on Josiah, that theme continues for the rest of the kings and the people. And beginning at verse 20, it actually begins a new paragraph break, a new section. And so from that point on to the end of the book, verses 20 through 23 are 85 or five times 17 words. And here we get to the direct reference to Jeremiah and his prophecy in verse 21 and following. First, Labashain actually points out that Jeremiah's prophecy is 17 words and 68 letters, or 4 times 17. So, another divine number occurrence. But Han writes of this, The word of the Lord to Jeremiah concerning the exile included the promise of a new temple a new house at Jerusalem in Judah. This is the immediate subject of Cyrus's edict, and it suggests that the chronicler must have had this larger vision of Jeremiah's prophecy in mind in saying that Cyrus's proclamation was to accomplish the word spoken to Jeremiah. Much is made of the chronicler's concluding his work with an abbreviated version of Cyrus's edict 
as found in the opening verses of Ezra. But he has done more than append Cyrus's words to make a neat ending to his book. The chronicler's editing here, as throughout his work, is deliberate. His editing focuses Cyrus's words on the key promise of the Davidic covenant, the building of a house for God in Jerusalem, and the imperative that the people join themselves to this effort. And there's another minor change that we will look at when we look at Cyrus's decree. And we'll pick up here with Lightheart concerning this language of the Sabbaths and the land enjoying its Sabbaths. Lightheart writes, Surprisingly, the chronicler identifies Judah's chief sin as a failure to give the land its Sabbaths. Every seven years, the land was supposed to be left fallow. Debts were to be canceled and slaves were to be manumitted. Judah has failed to give the land rest, oppressing the land and, by implication, oppressing one another. They have not kept the law of release as Israel did in the days of Ahaz. In one sense, the connection between Sabbath and exile is obvious, drawn directly from the warnings of Leviticus 26, 31-34. I will lay waste your cities. I will make the land desolate. You, however... I will scatter among the nations. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths, all the days of the desolation, while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. And it should be noted in line with this Leviticus language that we were just looking at, with this prediction of exile. And earlier we were discussing the Ma'al language. So all the people were exceedingly unfaithful. In Leviticus 26, further down in verse 40 or so, you have this language, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed. So it's the Ma'al language. And so here at the very end of Chronicles, we have this callback to this Sabbath's idea and this prediction of exile. And we'll pick up with Johnstone. He says, the vocabulary is derived from Leviticus 26, 34 through 35 and verse 43. The passage in Leviticus is of crucial importance for Chronicles presentation. As in Chronicles, the course of Israel's history, its exile and hope of return are all interpreted in terms of Ma'al and its expiation. And here he actually lists Verse 40 here. And Johnstone notes something very interesting here. Although we may have to take this earlier note first, which I actually left off. But Johnstone points out here that Cyrus's edict thus represents the proclamation of Jubilee in the 50th generation. That is the 50th generation from Adam. And so we'll go back to Johnstone. He says, The jubilee of the 50th generation from the creation of the world and of humankind has arrived. Now is the moment of the restoration of the relationship with humanity originally intended in Adam. So here at the end of this section, we very quickly go off the rails, end up in exile. And then here in verse 21, we're getting that prediction back, the restoration back out of exile. So we quickly go into exile and we're immediately coming out. Of course, there were 70 years involved in all of this. And so it's saying this generation, this 50th from Adam, is this Jubilee generation. Now is the moment of return to ancestral lands, to the ideal envisaged since the beginning of time. Central to this purpose is Israel. After all the vicissitudes of Israel as the finally designated agent of the restoration of the relationship, The moment has come for Israel when she will be enabled to fulfill her role and realize her destiny among the nations of the world. And the interesting part is I see this as an already but not yet in the sense that, at least in the Old Testament sense, because they do return back and rebuild the temple. Of course, there's never that sense that the spirit returned to the temple. The glory never came back. And as we've noted many times in this study, The glory eventually does come back. The word, the glory, the name of the Lord comes back, but it comes in the person of Jesus Christ and it's missed. 
And then we will close out here with the proclamation of Cyrus. And they've been alluding to it in the commentaries, but we'll just read it out now. In verse 22, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirits of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. And we'll pick up here with light heart. He says, Chronicles ends with the decree of Cyrus. We have known since 1 Chronicles 9 that Israel will survive the exile. The chronicler's genealogy is a pledge of the persistence of Yahweh's people, even through institutional and national collapse. And the book has been moving through a judges-like cycle of faithfulness and apostasy, leading us to expect a new David. We do not expect David to arise from Persia, but there is no doubt of Cyrus's Davidic credentials. Isaiah 44, 24 through 45, 7 explicitly identifies Cyrus as the king who will renew the Davidic vocation. When Cyrus speaks in Chronicles, he speaks like David. And concerning this proclamation that goes throughout all the kingdom, John Stone writes, once again, the connection with Leviticus should be noted. The legislation on the Jubilee in Leviticus 25, 9, there the same verb is used twice as here for sending round the trumpet that announces the inauguration of the Jubilee on the Day of Atonement, and there too it is throughout the whole of your land. And so once again, you have resonances back with Jubilee, also looping in Day of Atonement, again all of this having messianic foreshadowing to it as well. And Lightheart interacts with John Stone, he says, that he, that is John Stone, highlights another dimension of this passage. Cyrus's decree is phrased in terms of the Jubilee legislation of Leviticus 25. Jubilee is the great super Sabbath year that was to occur every half century. Cyrus issues a proclamation announcing freedom, permitting the Jews to return to their ancestral property. His decree of return announces that the great Sabbath year has arrived, the chronicler draws out a connection between Judah's Sabbath failure and Cyrus's sabbatical decree. It is time for a super, super Sabbath proclamation. By the chronicler's reckoning, Cyrus publicizes his decree in the 50th generation since Adam. And as we alluded to earlier, and maybe even in the first video on Chronicles, these last two verses are picked up and repeated at the beginning of Ezra. But there are some slight differences among them being in verse 3, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, so on and so forth. And you get an abbreviated version of that here, which is noteworthy. John Stone writes, thanks to the providential ordering of God, the whole of God's people stand poised at the moment of jubilee for return to their land. But strikingly, Chronicles does not include Jerusalem as the goal of the going up. He deliberately stops short of the version of the edict in Ezra in order to end on an eschatological note. He still writes in exile. The definitive return has not yet taken place. In light of the exposition of guilt and atonement in Leviticus 26, 40-45, that return awaits the final act of restoration in the mercy and good pleasure of God. Israel, in the meantime, is in the interim of waiting. And I find that very interesting, again, especially given the fact that, as we just noted, they did not see themselves as having completely come back from exile in the days of Christ. They were still in spiritual exile. And so in, in that sense, they were still awaiting to go up they were awaiting for Jubilee. And I noted it in a recent video that if you take a 3 BC or roughly thereabouts birthday of Jesus, 
And I did come across something else. It wasn't what I originally was trying to find, but I did find that, yes, in around that time, so if Jesus was born around 30 BC, then when he was about 30, again, thereabouts, you're looking at Jubilee years when Jesus began his public ministry, which would fit all of this stuff amazingly well. And so Chronicles began, the first word of this work was Adam, the first man in Genesis, and very similar to the prophecy of exile in Egypt by Joseph. You have that same go up language. And so in many ways, Chronicles has recapitulated Genesis. But with the Bible, you don't have complete cycles. History is not cyclic. It's not this pagan pure cycles idea. History might rhyme and it might feel like it's repeating. But in biblical theology, it's always moving further. It may recapitulate ideas, but it's always a shadow of something that's coming later. And so Genesis starts with Adam and ends with a prediction of bondage in Egypt. Chronicles also begins with Adam and ends with a proclamation to go up, again, presumably back to Jerusalem to build the temple. But that itself was not the end of the story. They still awaited the final Jubilee cycle where the Messiah would return and bring the heavenly temple down to earth to restore all things. But even that cycle itself still awaits the final restoration of all things. And so New Testament eschatology is that final cycle. But that is our study on the Chronicles. It took me a lot longer than I thought it would take. Thanks to anybody who's stuck with it this entire time. But as I mentioned before, the notes that I've been taking for First and Second Chronicles, I am going to be putting on Ko-Fi, although it will be behind a paywall. But if you DM me on Instagram or something and ask nicely, I'm sure we could figure something out. But that is about all. And I will see y'all later.